Hello, uh, my name's David, and I'm here from Australia, visiting a friend. And um, when I was 21, I was born and raised in the United States, and when I was 21, let's see, I've got 10 minutes. So, okay, <laughs> this is gonna be interesting. When I was 21, coming out of uh, being really reckless and um, self-destructive through my teenage years, I got involved with some evangelical Christians and they persuaded me to give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, which I did at the age of 21. And I set my heart to be a disciple and um, to know the Word of God and to live the Word of God. I didn't just want to sit in a pew somewhere. I wanted to really uh, know the Word and live the Word, especially when I started reading it and read all these really exciting things that I hadn't known existed, being raised in a devout Catholic family. For example, in uh, the Gospel of John, verse 12, it says, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. And I was like, wow, nobody ever told me that, you know. Or, you know, and then I got to the book of Acts, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, just signs and wonders and, and just all sorts of glorious things happening. And I was like, let's do this. <laughs> you know, it was so exciting. Um, but just to be honest, my evangelical Christian experience, uh, as time passed, became more and more frustrating. Um, I experienced uh, disappointment after disappointment and, and disappointment after disappointment as an evangelical Christian because uh, I don't know how much all of you know about evangelical Christianity and there's wonderful sincere people there for sure and I was one of them but generally the belief is this thing called scriptura sola which is the Bible only is the rule of faith and practice and um, Scripture sola doesn't work, okay? It, it, uh, there's, when Joseph Smith was a frustrated young man at the age of 14, uh, because he, there was all this religious confusion and he didn't know what to believe or who to follow, uh, there were approximately 200 different Christian groups and denominations on the face of the earth. And uh, the last time I checked a couple months ago at the Gordon-Conwell Theological Institute Study for World Christianity, the latest number is 46,000, okay? And all of that happens because someone has a Bible and they're part of a particular group, say the Free Will Baptists, and they see something in the scriptures that's different from what their group teaches. And so they split off and they start the Free Will Spirit-filled Baptists or the free will pre-tribulation spirit-filled Baptists, or the free will uh, mid-trib free will Baptists, or you get the picture, it's like, um, and, and it isn't just a, this isn't just a, a mental exercise you're talking about. You come to believe in Jesus, you wanna love one another, you wanna support one another, you wanna be one, you want to know what to believe and how then you should live. And there's no unity, there's no common voice. And on a regular basis, churches split after split after split. And people are hurt and people are hurt. And, and people, uh, basically, you believe in Jesus, but you're pretty much left to do whatever's right in your own eyes that you can justify from the Bible. The problem is you can justify pretty much anything from the Bible or nothing, you know. And uh, just to be clear, it, it gradually uh, became more and more frustrating and more and more disheartening because really, I really read the Word of God and I love the Word of God and it said uh, some very deep things like if you read the Lord Jesus Christ, high priestly prayer in John 17, the cry of his heart was that what would come forth from the sacrifice of his atonement would be that there'd be a people who would be one just as he and the Father are one, that the world would believe and that the world would know that he loves them just as much as he loves his only son. But what I was involved in was just this uh, Confusing mess, basically. Do you know, no, no common witness 
the, the witness of the evangelical Christianity there that I was involved in. I'm talking 47 years of trying to find a place where there was authority and unity and, uh, and, and a togetherness that was on a solid foundation and seeing it crash and burn over and over and over and over again. And uh, not have, you know, raising a family in the midst of that and not having anything real enough for my children to uh, see it was worth giving their lives to, okay? And so seeing the world gobble my children up as they got older. And I mean, I could tell you story after story, but uh, you're talking 47 years of heartbreak. Um, when I was 21, I, I, I really wanted to bear fruit that would remain. And in 47 years of trying, I never succeeded in doing it, okay? And you know, let, let's lighten it up a bit, okay? <laughs> let's lighten. It is a very sad story, actually, but it has a happy ending, okay? Because of you <laughs> and because of Joseph Smith and because of Brigham Young and because of the restoration that you are part of and might not even know how precious it is because you've been born and raised in it. But I got to a place where I had looked under every possible rock that I could think of to look under. I'd search time and space. I'd search the earth trying to find a place where, and you, this might sound odd to you, where there was actually a restoration of apostolic and prophetic authority so that you actually... See, if you read the Bible, if you're normal, you, oh, I wish I could walk with Jesus, you know. But in, in Matthew 10, 39, Jesus said an amazing thing. He said, look, you know, just even as my Father sent me, I'm sending you. He said, whoever receives you, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. And, and so... His plan, Heavenly Father's plan, when Christ ascended was not, behold, I give you a book. Throughout most of human history, nobody could read and they couldn't produce books if they could. You know, his plan was, uh, what is it in Ephesians 1, you know, in the dispensation of the fullness of times. And then ultimately in Ephesians, two, that he gathered together in one, everyone in Christ. And in Ephesians 2, it talks about how that, uh, that the church is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And I, I spent 47 years looking for restored apostles and prophets, and I never even thought of looking at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints because the truth is, the sad truth is, evangelical Christianity is filled with an accusatory fog. In the Book of Mormon, they call it a mist of darkness but it's an accusatory fog, a fog of accusation against the most beautiful thing on earth, against the restoration, against the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There's this accusatory fog that dismisses the Latter-day Saints as just not even being Christians, having a different Jesus, a different God. You've all heard this kind of thing. And, and uh, it's the unquestioned monolithic conversation of evangelical Christianity to the point that I heard or participated in conversations of this sort hundreds of times over almost half a century. And never once did I hear one voice raised in opposition to that fog of accusation, say, no, no, they believe in Jesus. There are brothers and I never heard such a thing said. So it never even occurred to me. I mean, I'm out there going around in circles dying of thirst in the desert for what you have. And I never even thought of visiting a, a Mormon, a Latter-day Saint church, or, to, or to, I had all sorts of encounters with Latter-day Saints. And they were uniformly, you all were like really nice. But that was just proof of how really evil you were because you, if you're so evil you can appear nice, boy, that's really dangerous, you know? I mean, this is, it's bizarre. It's absolutely bizarre. But I'm dying of thirst in the desert, and, you know, the earth is being flooded with darkness, and the ark of God is right in front of me, hiding in plain sight, and I can't even see it. 
How bizarre is that? It's frightening. So finally I got to a place where I, I just had no place else to look. I didn't know what else to do. So I said, well, I guess I'll just, I can't just kill myself. I guess I'll just try and memorize the Gospel of John and wait and see what God might do. So I, I started trying to memorize, I spent two years trying to memorize the Gospel of John. And then finally, um, amazingly, uh, last December 23rd, three months ago, approximately, the thought actually penetrated my thick skull. It's finally come to this. I think I have to check out these Mormons and find out what they believe. And that, that I could receive that thought after being steeped in this fog of accusation for my entire life is amazing to me. But I guess it just shows that desperation can be a good thing, you know. But um, I got on my laptop. And this is on the south coast of New South Wales, Australia. Oh. There's a Latter-day Saint Church, Mormon Church in Dapto. And so I got the phone number and I called it up and, hello. And it was these two sister missionaries. I didn't even know such a thing existed. <laughs> you know, all I'd encountered all my life were elders, you know, that were like 19 and, you know, I'm like, wherever I was in my life, I'm 48. I know the Bible like my, the back of my hand. Your elders, get out of here. You know, that, that was my reaction, you know, the, the old male pride. But I was helpless against these sister missionaries. You know, I was like, you know, I was like, I said, I need to find out what you people believe. And so we met the next day and uh, these two sister missionaries, Sister Braithwaite and Sister Devereaux, they sat down on the other side of the picnic table from me next to the Pacific Ocean. And uh, they started sharing the plan of salvation with me. And uh, just the simplest of things. And they were just, they're just regular, you know, they're just like all of you, all you young ladies here. And you know, if they had been young men, I'm sure I would listen to them. I was desperate enough by then not to let my male pride destroy me. But it was stunning because these two sisters, I found out later, they just absolutely love the church and love the general authorities. And they, they just, they really received the apostles and prophets. You know, they were, you know, like they have Leahona from the last conference and they've got President Nelson's, you know, every other phrase is highlighted and all this. But do you know what? Because they received the ones that were sent. Who did they receive? It was like I was talking to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like there was an authority there. And they had an authority. And I'm like, they're 19 year old girls. How can they have authority like this? I couldn't believe it. It just blew my mind. I'd never, I'd never experienced anything like it. And I knew, I, I mean, I'd learned stuff wandering around in the desert because everywhere I went, I, I tested all things and held fast to what seemed good. And one thing I'd learned is that real faith is the recognition of authority. It's like when Heavenly Father's authority is staring you in the face, like the centurion. You know, he's a pagan Roman soldier with a hundred Roman soldiers under him. And he comes up to the Lord Jesus Christ and he's like, look, I'm a man under authority. I say, go and he goes, come and he comes. You don't even need to come to my house. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. And Christ's response is, Man, I haven't seen faith like this anywhere in Israel, you know? And that's what, it's like I'm listening to these sister missionaries and they're just, they're just, they're no different than you. They weren't like Supergirl or something, you know? But because they were in love with the, Latter, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and in love with the covenant path and in love with President Nelson and, you know, the, the apostolic leaders of the church and the teaching of the church, when they spoke to me, all I could think of is what, what uh, it says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, at the end of Matthew chapter 7, when it says uh, that the people were astonished at his teaching because he spoke as one having authority and not as their teachers of the law. And that, that's what it was like. And it just like, it blew my mind. And uh, so I, I, I kept meeting with them. And a couple times I tried to draw back, back because there were some things that we had to work through that were hard, 
But I just couldn't escape the certainty that, that I was being drawn by the Spirit of the living God and that the authority, I finally, after a lifetime of looking for it, I finally found where that authority was. Because really it's like, you know, without apostolic and prophetic, without the restoration of apostolic and prophetic authority, and of course that means Joseph Smith, is truly a prophet of God. The Book of Mormon is true, and the Doctrine and Covenants is true. It's like everything follows from that, but without that authority, you're just, you're still floundering in the ocean, you know? It's only the authority of God that really lifts you up onto the ark and can put you on a covenant path, and just in closing, it's like, those sister missionaries, they saved my life, man. Just their willingness just to go out and, and just, the plan of salvation they presented to me. I'd been walking around for 30 years knowing that that was the plan of salvation and I didn't know any place in evangelical Christianity. You know, I, I couldn't, it had been decades since I had had faith to try to get people to ask Jesus into their heart. I'd been baptized five times and I'd only gotten wet. Okay, because that's what happens if there isn't proper authority to actually bring you onto a covenant path where you can be under good authority and walking together with one another towards fulfilling your divine potential, you know? And, uh, so anyway, over the next, over the next uh, two months, I just attended the ward, fell in love with everybody there, fell up in love with Bishop Masima and, and started listening to the conference talks. I fell in love with the general authorities. I mean, I mean, I looked for leaders like you have everywhere on earth for almost half a century. And I didn't even know that, that your people of the quality of your leaders even existed. I found nothing like them anywhere. And then I started listening to these conference talks. It's just stunning. The, the quality of their communication, the, the, the faithfulness that they have, you know, like President Nelson, he can say more in 17 minutes than I can say in seven hours. It's just stunning. I've probably listened to Overcome the World and Find Rest 30 times in the last two months. But what you have is beyond glorious. And um, when I first gave my life to Jesus, I thought it was going to be glorious and easy, and it was just brutally hard. And, you know, there's millions of evangelical Christians out there that are dying. They're, a lot of them become atheists because they get so fed up with it after the fourth church split or not being able. I wanted to become a holy man. I didn't have the power to become a holy man because there wasn't, there wasn't the authority there and there wasn't a covenant path to walk. Oh, when, how long ago did you start waving? 10 minutes ago? <laughs> I told her to start waving when I had a minute left. My friend back there, I'm so sorry. But uh, anyway, do I have time to sing a little song? Please. Okay. Because when I was 21, one of the first songs I learned as an evangelical Christian I fell in love with. And this is what I was looking for, and this is what I needed. And I just found it when I was baptized five weeks ago. And it's from uh, word for word from the King James Version, Isaiah chapter 35, verse eight to 10. And it's about the highway of holiness, which is the covenant path that only exists in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints under the leadership of your apostolic and prophetic restoration. But this is how it goes. It goes, and a highway shall be there, and a way called the way of holiness, the unclean shall shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, this is my favorite line, the wayfaring man, though a fool, will not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with song and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing will flee away. 
And that's, that's what I've been looking for all my life. And I'm very thankful that I found it because of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, every faithful saint that's walked that path since then, there's, there's actually an art for the 68 year old man to climb aboard after a lifetime of broken hearted searching. And I'm just really grateful.